On today's episode, a tale of three space capsules, New Glenn takes a scenic route to the launch pad, and Rocket Lab is betting big on Neutron. American crewed space capsules have gone from being pretty much non-existent five years ago to becoming a major source of debate in modern spaceflight, and not even SpaceX is immune to the ongoing controversy. But there can be only one king of bad news, and that's Boeing. Whatever happened to the Boeing Starliner? The beleaguered capsule returned to Earth two months ago, and we have yet to really hear anything at all from the company behind this comedy of errors. Turns out the reason for Boeing's silence might have something to do with an attempt to sell off their troubled spacecraft. Boeing doesn't want to say anything that might devalue the vehicle any further than it already is, if such a thing were even possible. Rumors continue to persist that Boeing is actively trying to sell their way out of the company's space capsule operations. This is in addition to the sale of United Launch Alliance, which is a Boeing and Lockheed Martin joint venture. Although according to a report from Wall Street Journal, the one thing that Boeing intends to maintain is their stake in NASA's moon rocket, the SLS which for its part has flown once so far without any issues at all, though it somehow managed to cost like $5 billion just to do that, which Boeing was able to pocket for themselves thanks to a cost plus contract system. Meanwhile, new reports show that Starliner is at least $1.85 billion in the hole. This is thanks to a fixed price contract with NASA, something that Boeing has reportedly told the agency they will not be bidding on again in the future. This coincides with the new CEO, Kelly Ortberg, being appointed at Boeing in August of this year. One of the first things that she did was to fire the head of the company's defense and space operations in September. Although the space operations are much smaller than the defense contract side of things, which also is losing billions of dollars. As for who might buy the Starliner, reports indicate that Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin have been circling like vultures around the dead project. We know that the company likes Starliner for some reason. It appeared in their animated promo video for the Orbital Reef space station. I don't think we'll ever see a Starliner on top of New Glenn, but there's probably some value in Blue Origin just gutting the internal systems and transplanting them into a new vehicle. Similar theory for another potential buyer, Sierra Space. They already have a better spaceship design in the Dream Chaser, but it's currently just a cargo ship. They still need to figure out life support and all of that, which is the one thing that Starliner has actually been very successful at. Anyway, let's move on from beating a dead horse to taking shots at the king. SpaceX is slipping and people are starting to notice. At an October 31st meeting of NASA's Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, the SpaceX Crew Dragon and Falcon 9 rocket system were specifically called out for safety concerns. This is coming from former astronaut Kent Rominger, who holds the record for the highest number of hours logged on board the Space Shuttle Orbiter. And Kent discussed a laundry list of recent issues that have affected the SpaceX vehicles in previous months. Now, this is not intended to be so much of a criticism from the NASA panel, but more of a reminder to remain vigilant about safety as this company increases the pace of its missions. Which is fair to say, after years of flawless operation, the SpaceX Falcon rocket system has encountered a persistent string of malfunctions and failures in the second half of 2024. In July, the rocket's upper stage engine failed to perform a second burn to reach orbit, which was caused by a leak in the liquid oxygen system, and the result was a total loss of the payload. In September, there was a second upper stage malfunction on the Crew-9 flight, where the engine failed to complete a successful deorbit burn after separating from the Dragon capsule. In August, a Falcon 9 booster also failed to land successfully, which is not something that's considered to be mission critical, landing a booster is more like the cherry on top, but it's also worth questioning why something that had been working perfectly for so long suddenly encountered a new problem. And then, in the return of the Dragon capsule with NASA's Crew-8 astronauts on October 25th, the Dragon's parachutes had a slight anomaly, with one of the four lagging slightly behind the others as they deployed to slow the capsule. Now, no one is saying that any one of these single incidents is anything to worry about on their own, but Rominger did say, quote, 
When you look at these recent incidents over the last handful of weeks, it does lead one to say that it's apparent that operating safety requires a significant attention to detail as hardware ages and the pace of operations increases. Both NASA and SpaceX need to maintain focus on safe Crew Dragon operations and not take any normal operations for granted. For their part, the safety panel appears to have rightly attributed the increase in anomalies to the simultaneous increase in operational volume. No rocket system has ever flown as frequently as Falcon 9, not even close, and the use of the SpaceX booster is still increasing at a pretty rapid pace. Now, let's talk about an example of a vehicle that has only flown one time, yet still managed to have an even bigger problem than anything that SpaceX has ever experienced. NASA's Orion capsule returned from space in 2022 with these big gnarly holes in its protective heat shield. This was only revealed to us back in May, and now the space agency has revealed that they know the reason why the material failed. But they won't tell us. At a meeting of NASA's advisory council in August, we were told that an independent review team had completed its analysis of the heat shield erosion, but no details were revealed at the time. It wasn't until October 28th at a meeting of the Lunar Exploration Analysis Group when a follow-up question was answered about the findings of that investigation, with a NASA administrator saying that those reviews had determined what caused the additional char loss on the heat shield. The administrator in NASA's Exploration Systems Development, Lori Glaze, told reporters, quote, We have conclusive determination of what the root cause is of the issue. We have been able to demonstrate and reproduce it in the ArcJet facilities at Ames. Okay, great. So, what was the cause then? Glaze replied, I'm not going to share that right now. Okay, so when will we share it? When it comes out, it will all come out together. So stay tuned on that one, now let's switch directions to talk about the biggest unknown on the launch schedule this year, New Glenn. Blue Origin has taken a significant step forward with its massive New Glenn rocket, rolling it out to the launch pad at Cape Canaveral for the first time. But with just two months left in 2024, the big question remains, can New Glenn take flight by the end of the year, which was something promised to us by Jeff Bezos himself. Let's take a closer look at what this rollout means and why it matters. Moving the first stage of New Glenn to the launch site isn't just a transportation milestone. It's one of the rare few signals we've received that the rocket is actually getting close to its much anticipated debut launch. Interestingly enough, moving a rocket this large to its launch pad was harder than you might think. Although Blue Origin's rocket facility is only a few kilometers from Cape Canaveral's Launch Complex 36, the massive size of New Glenn required the rocket to take a 37-kilometer route to get there. To carry the first stage, Blue Origin's team designed a new vehicle called GERT, which stands for Giant Enormous Rocket Truck. The transporter consists of two massive trailers linked by custom-built cradles with a strong back assembly. Altogether, GERT rides on 22 axles with a total of 176 tires to distribute the vehicle's massive weight. This setup is towed by a tractor originally used by the US Army to haul battle tanks. Combined with the transporter, the rocket stretches 95 meters in length. The New Glenn first stage alone measures 7 meters in diameter, making it too large to safely pass beneath bridges or navigate conventional roads. Of course, New Glenn isn't quite ready for liftoff just yet. Two crucial tests lie ahead before the rocket can attempt its maiden voyage. First, the team will conduct a wet dress rehearsal, where New Glenn will be fully loaded and all ground systems will be tested to ensure that they are launch ready. Next comes the hot fire test, during which the rocket's seven BE-4 engines will ignite for several seconds, verifying they're fully operational and ready for launch. Jeff Bezos, Blue Origin's founder, is pushing hard for New Glenn's debut this year, but the schedule is very tight, and there's no guarantee that the tests will proceed flawlessly. So could New Glenn still make it off the ground by year's end? SpaceX's first Falcon Heavy took over a month from rollout to launch. That's about the closest comparison we can draw, and if Blue Origin can follow a similar timeline, an early December launch might still be within reach, but only if all the tests go as planned. 
In the coming weeks, we'll be watching closely to see if New Glenn meets these final milestones. To be honest though, the new rocket that I'm looking forward to even more than New Glenn is the Rocket Lab Neutron. And according to a new update this week, the medium lift reusable launcher is on track to fly before the end of next year. Rocket Lab CEO Peter Beck revealed that the company will be bidding Neutron for the next phase of US Space Force National Security Space Launch contracts. The big requirement would be that Neutron must be ready for its first launch by December 2025, and Beck says that Neutron can deliver. Rocket Lab has presented Neutron as a reusable medium lift rocket that would be able to deploy 13 metric tons into low Earth orbit while recovering the first stage booster with a propulsive ground landing. This would put Rocket Lab in direct competition with SpaceX and their Falcon 9, which is not a bad thing. It's almost universally good to have more economical rockets in the game. The Lane 1 missions that Rocket Lab is bidding for are considered to be more tolerant to risk and intended to facilitate faster launches of less sensitive payloads. This is a much different category than the heavy lift high value payloads that are currently being granted to Falcon Heavy, New Glenn, and Starship. But the demand for these Lane 1 national security payloads is expected to grow quickly in the near future. Like we said before, Falcon 9 is already very heavily leveraged, and it's not immune to failure. Having a second, medium-sized, reusable booster would provide much-needed redundancy, and in addition, the market for space launch services is only getting bigger. With the futures of ULA and Blue Origin very much uncertain at this point, Rocket Lab is the only company besides SpaceX who are regularly flying payload to orbit, so they deserve a bigger seat at the table. Of course, we have yet to see a Neutron test article, but in August, Rocket Lab reached a significant milestone when it conducted the first static fire test of the Archimedes engine, which is fueled by methane and liquid oxygen. The test took place at NASA's Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. Beck noted that Rocket Lab has continued to produce the engines for Neutron's qualification campaign, saying, quote, we are running engines just constantly. It's kind of interesting to note that the qualification testing campaign is taking place at a former Virgin Orbit facility in Long Beach, California, which Rocket Lab acquired following that company's bankruptcy filing. Rocket Lab is constructing Neutron's first launch pad at NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. The company says they are in the process of working with the FAA to secure a launch license. And Beck couldn't help but get in a jab against his competition here, telling reporters, quote, Contrary to some others, we have a really fantastic relationship with the FAA. We'll see how it goes.